What I'm going to cover, first off, just IFC's investment pace, um, you know, private equity, it's a matter of scale, what segments of the market you can go in. So just what our investment size and pace has been so you can get some context around it. Uh, the returns, the results we've achieved to date since 2000 when we created a dedicated department to invest in private equity funds, um, what are the results and what's driven those results. And then since fund selection is a large part of what drove the returns, how do we select funds, just very briefly, and then looking forward to future trends. Um, just a bit of background, IFC, for those of you who don't know, is the private, ec private sector part of the World Bank Group. So the World Bank deals with governments, we only deal with the private sector. 75% uh, of what IFC does is lending, 25% is equity, and of the equity, about four-fifths we do directly, and one-fifth we do through funds, which is the division I'm in charge of. Um, our mandate, basically, is to go where commercial investors think the risk-return profile is not quite in their favor, do the transactions, get proof of concept, and then when commercial investors move in, we move on. So, first point, our results have been achieved at scale. We've been investing, well, the department was started in 2000. We had, we've been investing in private equity funds since the late 80s. By 1999, the results were not very good, and they were dramatically under IFC's direct investment results. Uh, in fact, the results were about 20, 25% of the results you're going to be seeing. Um, so in 2000, the old portfolio was all pulled together. We started a new department. We analyzed what had gone wrong. We cut the investment pace to about 150, 200 million a year. Because of the J curve, we finally got proof of concept in 2005. And since then, we've had about four, 500 million a year allocated to us to invest. So the returns. Firstly, we've outperformed the, emerging, the Cambridge Emerging Market Index quite convincingly. Uh, and you'll see pale gray bars down on the left. Pre-crisis, we're sitting at 23%. IRR since 2000. Uh, currently it's about 19.7. It went through a dip just after the crisis down to about 15. And it's ahead of both the, the top quartile on the general index and the Asia index. Um, also, it's running ahead of the MSCI. So that bottom left green chart, that's identical cash flows put into and taken out of the MSCI on the same dates as we went into the funds. And you can see that the funds, our funds are outperforming what we would have got if we'd gone into the public markets. Now, a key part of this is that our portfolio, our investment pattern, has been much more diversified than the general index. So while the index uh, has over 60% in Asia, we're running at about currently 27, 28% in Asia, where the index has about 8% in Africa, we're currently around 24. And we think that geographic, that much broader ge geographic diversification has really benefited the results both in terms of returns and if you look at the top right-hand corner of that chart, in terms of the volatility. So we've got higher returns at lower volatility, I think largely through the diversification. So given that the returns are nicely in the top quartile, what's driven that? And potentially, there's four things you could think of. There's many different types of funds out there. Uh, you can use a fund to wrap around pretty much anything. So which types of funds have we selected out of all that? Um, and how important has that been? Then the fund size, there's a lot of evidence that you know, smaller mid-cap funds outperform larger funds. Geography and manager selection. So this may be a wee bit complex to see on the screen, but uh, the conference will give you copies of this if you ask them. I think they should make them available afterwards. This is the, these are the verticals that we divide the investable space and emerging markets into. And the part that we like is the growth equity space. Most emerging market private equity is growth equity because there's not very much leverage. So, and out of the growth equity space, we like the smaller and mid-cap parts of it. We also invest for developmental reasons in that small business space on the left. You can see the, our estimated returns there are only around 7 to 8%, so that's probably not going to attract commercial investors. But using that model, we can get business going in places like Haiti, Sierra Leone, and create jobs there, and get our cost of capital back. So most of what we're doing is concentrated in the smaller to mid-cap part of the growth equity space. And again, this is just the, this is within the Cambridge Index. Actually, this is from Empire. Um, so this is fundraising over the last several fund cycles and just the number of funds in each size bracket and the percentage of capital in each size bracket. And you can see that most of the funds by number are less than 500 million. Most of the capital 
is above 500 million. In fact, a lot of it's over a billion. So the capital's concentrated at the big end. We mostly invest in those funds under 500 million. And Cambridge data indicates that for emerging market funds, the funds less than 750 million in size outperform those that are larger. So certainly by, by focusing on the smaller mid-cap funds, it's helped our performance. Manager selection is really what's made the biggest contribution in addition to the types of funds we backed, focusing on that growth equity space. And to create these charts, what we did was firstly just take the Cambridge indices and say, well, if you'd kept the Cambridge, <coughs> sorry, if you'd taken our weightings, our geographic weightings compared to Cambridge, but put the Cambridge returns by geography into them, um, would that have improved our performance or not? So basically looking at geographic selection. And in general, compared to the Cambridge or compared to the MSCI, we haven't made a lot of money by playing geographic selection games. And basically, we're not really trying to. The way we select where we go geographically is through IFC's annual strategy and budget process, which really doesn't take account much of forward-looking trends. So you wouldn't expect to see it in our case. Where we have made the money is on the manager selection, quite significantly. So, and the way we calculated that was simply to take the, the weightings in the, in the benchmark and say, well, if you put our returns per geography against those weightings, what would it come out like? And it's much higher. So basically, manager selection has driven a lot of our performance. And then maybe a surprising thing, we back a lot of first-time funds. And these are not the first-time funds that I think if I, I used to manage the World Bank Pension Fund and when I was doing that, these are not the type of first-time funds I would have backed then. Then it was more funds spinning out of an existing manager. Now the funds we're backing, they really are first time. These people may not have done private equity before. Um, and over half the portfolio is invested in those sorts of funds. But interestingly, the first time funds have outperformed the other funds. And I think this shows that in emerging markets, there is an early mover advantage. So you may pick an inexperienced team, but they're going into a market where there's not so much competition that they're under pressure, which would cause them to make mistakes. Um, they may have six months to 12 months to kick the tires on a deal to get inside it to understand it. So firstly, they have time to identify issues. Secondly, um, once they finally invest, they already have a 100-day plan to implement. So there is a early mover advantage there, which in the last 10 years has been quite significant. So just to summarize, our results have been driven by taking advantage of the entire global, global private equity opportunity. Um, not just going to Asia, not just going to BRICS. Uh, concentration in mid-sized and smaller funds, good manager selection, and capturing what we see as an early mover premium. So let's look at fund selection since that plays a large role. What do we actually look for in the funds that we select? Well, the first thing is we don't really think we can rely on track record in emerging market private equity yet. Now, part of that is that these are nascent markets and and by the nature of nascent markets, there aren't that many managers with a full three-fund, full-exit track record, so you can run some sort of performance metric that you'd normally run. Um, but that aside, these markets are changing. And so somebody's track record in emerging markets um, may be based on market conditions which no longer exist. So, for example, in our Chinese funds, the earlier ones we did 1999, 2002, around about then, the companies they were backing were growing at 20 to 70 percent per annum. Now in that environment, the GP team doesn't need a lot of operating experience to guide the um, owner of the company. Because even if the owner of the company makes a mistake and 70 percent goes to 30 percent growth, you're still going to achieve your IRR target. These days, the companies that the funds in China are backing are growing at more like 20 to 30 percent. That's still a nice growth rate. But at that growth rate, you didn't have so much room for errors. So any team in China these days probably needs operating partners to have the same success as it would have had back in 2002. So you can't, because the markets are evolving, you've got to look a little bit more deeply at what drove the track record, have things changed. Um, then that aside, when we decide to go into a market, what do we look for? Well, the first thing, we actually ask, is there enough private equity deal flow to support a dedicated country fund? Now, obviously, in the BRICS there is, but when we first started looking at this in 2000, we decided only the BRICS in South Africa had enough deal flow to support country funds. Everything else had to be regional to get enough deal flow to be selective enough. 
These days there's probably 20, 30 countries where there's enough deal flow for a dedicated country fund. Still you need regional funds. Um, what does that matter? We made the mistake in the 90s of confusing demand for equity with private equity deal flow, and they're completely different things. Private equity deal flow, you need control or influence, not just some owner of a company who would like some extra equity capital from a passive investor. Um, and so if you can't get enough activist positions, then the result will be, as we had in the 90s, funds that either fail to invest fully or panic in the last year and waste the money on stupid investments. Um, so, and as that landscape changes, as we see more companies coming to the cusp of being interesting with deal flow, then we move in and try and find teams that we think can take advantage of that. Um, and of course we think as these teams, as you can get to country funds, we think there's an improve, improvement in quality of de-risking because these, these groups are going to be closer to the market in which they're investing. They're going to be closer to the deal flow. Um, reg a regional fund, it has worked in the past. As you get more country funds moving in and working, a regional guy is going to face more and more competition at the individual country level, and he's going to be more distant from it. Um, the second thing we look at, once we're satisfied that there's enough deal flow, is which of the drivers of return are available. I mean, you all know this is only about four things that drive return in private equity. Uh, there's top line revenue growth, there's margin expansion inside the business, there's multiple expansion pricing, you know, what the earnings are worth, what they'll sell for, uh, and leverage. Now, in the US, Europe, all those things are in play. You go to emerging markets, the leverage really falls off very heavily. Um, and so most of what drives returns in emerging markets is top line revenue growth or, pro or profits or improvements in margins. It's growth, cap it's growth equity. And for growth equity, um, you need operating partners, particularly since in most of these emerging markets you've got minority positions. You don't have so many control positions. So if you've got a minority position in a fast-growing company, what does that entrepreneur need? He needs a lot of advice and hand-holding. And so if you've got the capacity to do that, firstly, you're more likely to get the transaction compared to a GP who doesn't have that. Uh, and secondly, you're more likely to get that company through, meet the hurdles, and get an exit. So we really look for GPs that have um, good operating partners. We also look for GPs that are local, because we do think, as I said before, it's a very local business. Someone local will understand how many sets of books a company typically has in that market. They'll have networks from their old schools to find managers that they can pull out of the existing large companies that are willing to take the risk to transfer to a growing company because they know their friend. Um, they'll be much more able to manage the relationship in a minority situation so they're seen as a partner. So we really think it's a very local business. Um, so we look for local teams, we look for operating partners. There are some variations. I mean, South Africa has a much more sophisticated capital market, there's more leverage available. So in South Africa, investment bankers are much more useful and relevant as private equity people than they are in other places. Um, Brazil, there's a lot of platform build-ups and industry consolidation, so someone has, who has M&A experience is a useful partner. Uh, but by and large, it's growth equity. And then alignment of incentives, and this, many panelists before me have spoken about this, you know, do they have skin in the game? Is the carry shed reasonably around the team? Particularly since we back so many first-time teams, with first-time groups, there's always a risk that somebody in the setup phase has a lot of influence and may claim a large part of the carry. In the first fund, that may be okay. In the second fund, if it's successful, the track record will accrue to the team. That founder has to be prepared to be watered back a lot in their carry share. So we just check their attitude to that. So what are the future? Because these markets are evolving, so it's all very well to look backwards, but what about looking forwards? So we still think diversification is going to be very beneficial. The more of the opportunity you can take, um, take advantage of, the better. We still think the early entrant premium will be there. It's going to be diminishing, but certainly for the next five, seven, eight years, I think it's going to be there. Um, the mid-market will continue to be attractive, and the markets will continue to evolve. So track record and isolation will stay a weaker indicator of future performance than it is in developed markets developed markets. The real risk that I see, um, <clears throat> I think a lot of investors, particularly if they're used to the US and, and Europe, overstate and overestimate the risks of emerging markets. They have a CNN moment view of the risks in these markets. It's all people running around with guns or starvation or something horrible. Um, in fact, that's not really the case. And in a sense, these markets are a lot less risky 
than the US and Europe because there's a lot less leverage. So I'm a trustee of the World Bank Pension Fund and I used to manage that portfolio and watching what happened to that portfolio's holdings of US and European private equity during the crisis, the leverage really bit very fast and very hard. And if it hadn't been for quantitative easing, allowing those private equity groups to refinance very quickly, um, there would have been a lot of damage. In our portfolio, there's very little leverage. Those economies kept growing. There was very little damage at the company level. Um, so going through the crisis, I think our portfolio was actually a lot more stable and a lot safer than a typical US or European LBO portfolio. Um, the real risk, the real constraint is scale. Um, as more investors, if you look at the indicators of investor intentions to invest in emerging market private equity, they've been on an upward track for the last several years. Now people for various reasons haven't been acting so much on those intentions, but the intentions have been rising. Um, this opportunity still lacks scale, and there's a graph that quite often gets shown in presentations, and I'm guilty of doing it myself, of fundraising as a percentage of GDP, and you see I think the ratio in the US is, I don't know, I think it's about two, or a bit over one. In the emerging markets, it's quite low, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, um, even in the BRICS. So it suggests that these markets are very underpenetrated and you can put more money in. What that chart doesn't take into account is the different, huge difference in leverage. There's an awful lot of companies in emerging markets that don't make good private equity targets because their earnings, while they're nice, not 8% growth per annum, 10% growth per annum, um, which in the US, Europe would be nice growth rates. In the absence of leverage, you can't get that to a 25% 25, 25 gross IRR to give your investors 20 net. So I think the, the real constraint of the sofa is you know, the risk going forward is that as investors start to act on their intentions, different markets will get into bubbles fairly quickly. And we monitor dry powder. Um, we get estimates from Impia. Well, we get the numbers and we make our own estimates based on the average cash tracking of our portfolio. And at the moment, Brazil looks, it's got record levels of dry powder. I mean, that market has got to be a little bit risky. China, on the other hand, although it's got record levels of dry powder, the numbers turn out to be not quite so solid. A lot of that's RMB money. And the RMB funds um, were playing a pre-IPO game. That game's ended. The Chinese investors, being sensible people and not feeling so constrained by contracts, are now not meeting capital calls. So part of that Chinese dry powder is really not there. India is getting very low levels of dry powder. Um, investors haven't been putting money there. Dry powder is getting very low. Prices are beginning to crack. Um, so, but there, you, know, you do have to watch that. So what are we looking at now? Um, China, we're trying to get, <clears throat> trying to find managers who can invest sensibly in the West and North where private equity is less developed and where pricing will be more attractive. Um, and we're looking at growth equity, not pre-IPO, which a lot of funds in China have been keen on. Um, as I said before, the dry powder is less excessive than estimates indicate. The other interesting thing, um, and also operating partners you now need in that market, whereas previously you didn't. Um, interesting thing, control positions, which in a market like this, which came out of communism in the 1980s, where most firms are still in the hands of the first owner, the founder, you wouldn't think you'd get generation change driving deal flow for maybe another 20 years. And because of the one-child policy, you're beginning to see it. And in the last couple of years, according to um, contacts there, I wouldn't want to overemphasize it, but there's been a growing number of entrepreneurs coming out from the hinterland, turning up to brokers in Shanghai and Beijing, and saying, I have a company. It's quite a nice mid-sized company. My one child doesn't want it. What do I do? Um, so you're beginning to see an increase in control positions through that, which didn't exist before. Um, India, India is really very interesting. In fact, we've taken quite a significant bet on India in the last two years. We've invested considerably more than our strategic targets required us to. Um, and India is a place where we didn't invest very much before the crisis because we weren't seeing good growth equity managers. We're seeing a lot of people who wanted to play momentum games because in India, because it's easy to list a company, um, a lot of what were labeled private equity managers were really playing a momentum game based on the public market and rising multiples. And when the crisis came, that game ended. Um, and now it's been ended for long enough that they're thinking, well, what else can we do? 
well, we can do growth equity. Growth equity is a lot more work than momentum. Growth equity, you need operating partners. Let's find operating partners. Well, in India, you've got a very deep bench of management talent. You can get operating partners. So in the last two years, there have been new funds coming along with operating partners really properly designed to do growth equity, a much better offering than we'd seen, post -cri than we'd seen pre crisis. So we've started to bet, uh, back those quite, quite extensively. We're also looking for funds that are moving more towards the frontier states, tier two, tier three cities where there's less penetration. Um, and also in India, the deal flow is also evolving. So you're beginning to see more control positions uh, for a couple of reasons. One is the family owned companies which dominate the landscape. There's been a certain amount of industry consolidation. So they're beginning to see more competitive pressure and they're beginning to have to make a decision, do we actually increase our capital and you know, take up the challenge or do we, re do we sell out and retire? So you're beginning to see a little bit of con more control uh, positions from that. The other thing you're seeing is the big conglomerates there who pre-crisis had no intention of selling anything. You'd approach them with a tiny little company they own somewhere and they're probably not even aware of and say, would you like to sell this? And it's just an automatic no. Um, now, they're still not looking to focus on core business. They still want to hold everything. But if someone approaches them with an interesting offer for some small thing they own, yeah, they're more likely to say yes now. So the deal flow in India is improving as well. Um, new markets uh, have five minutes. Um, we just backed our first Philippine fund. We've been looking at the Philippines and deal flow there for several years and didn't think there was enough deal flow to support a dedicated country fund. We've just recently decided there is, so we just backed our first fund there. Um, Bangladesh, political risk aside, which seems to have been mounting in the last few weeks, um, has got an uptick in deal flow because credit shrunk. And so people are now more willing to take an equity partner to get the financing they need. Um, and Thailand has only ever had one dedicated fund, which has done very well. There's quite a lot of deal flow there, but it's been difficult to find a manager who can take advantage of it. I mean, it's a local business, and there aren't many ties in this business. But we've just found a team there that we quite like, so we're backing a second fund there. Um, Russia, Turkey, Indonesia, Sub-Saharan Africa, Central America, all places where we've invested and we're going back to. Um, Vietnam and Egypt are more the outliers to watch. Egypt had great deal flow pre-crisis, um, pre-Arab um, Spring. The Arab Spring has put a considerable dent in private equity activity in the Middle East. Um, but nonetheless, the companies are still there, so it's worth watching to see if the opportunity opens up again. And Vietnam is a bit of an odd case. Um, it had a situation a little bit like India pre-crisis, where there are a lot of people chasing a momentum game. At one stage, there are over 65 so-called private equity funds. That's all blown up. What you're left with is a very small group of managers, a couple of whom are competent. Um, the deal flow hasn't expanded as fast as we thought it would. Um, they're approaching WTO accession that should start to trigger a growth of deal flow. It hasn't for various reasons, but we now think in the next few years it will. So, thank you. Any questions? Uh, currently about 3.6 billion in commitments. The actual, their investment in companies? Yeah. It varies an awful lot. Yeah. Um, hmm, to be honest, I don't know. Um, I, don't, I don't know what the average is. But the, the f oh, yeah. well, we always have to be less than 20%. Um, but the fund sizes we back are anywhere from 10 million to about 700 million, typically more 100 to 300. Um, okay, on the Russia one, we haven't done very much in Russia. We did several funds early on. We're just going back this year, last year, for the first time in several years. And <coughs> private equity in Russia really hasn't expanded very much. In fact, 
the Russia crisis killed a lot of funds and there hasn't really been a regrowth until recently. And what's driving the deal flow there is a little different to other places. In other places, it's the, the general growth is creating an increase um, in disposable income, which is then spilling into the domestic consumer sector, which is what's driving a lot of the deal flow and opportunity. In Russia, you've got some of that, maybe not quite so much, but you've got some. Um, but what you've <clears throat> at this stage got, you've got certain industry verticals that are dominated by oligarchs. Well, you don't want to go there because you get a company up to a certain size, you only exit options to an oligarch. There's other industry verticals where there's no oligarch, and they're usually in the consumer spaces because you know, in a communist country, there's not much in the way of a decent business sitting in the consumer space. That's all been built post-communism. So you've now got a situation of, uh, sort of like Brazil where you've got good consumer companies in the same space, say one off in Novosibirsk, one off in St. Petersburg, one at Katerinburg, well now you can consolidate. And so we're looking at a couple of funds who are looking at those sort of industry cons platform consolidations. Um, in terms of the leakage, um, I guess there's two ways I could interpret that question. One is just how do we deal with politically connected people? And the answer is we don't. Um, we vet funds very carefully um, for politically exposed people, IDD, this sort of thing. Um, to the, even to the extent that we turned down a very interesting fund in a country we'd love to get into uh, because their chief operating person had worked for the Prime Minister's office and even though all our reference checks came back, and we've got offices in all these countries, came back, this person was seen as totally clean. The fact that they'd worked in the Prime Minister's office just optically, we didn't want to take the risk. Um, so we try very hard at the outset to avoid that. I mean, although it might sound a nice story that, well, you know, my uncle is the Minister of X and therefore I can get you deal flow, well, you know, that might last for a couple of years and poof. Um, and also, too, frankly, it's just not the way we want to do business. Um, the other way to look at that, and this really isn't so much on political connection, it's more just, if you go back to the 90s, there was a big difference in the returns to the majority and the minority equity, and in, in emerging market private equity. Um, the majority were getting the proper return, the minority was getting a considerable haircut taken off. And most of that came about because the GPs at that stage, a lot of them were investment bankers or had financial backgrounds, they went operating people, they were taking minority positions. They were smart, they were local, they got access. The entrepreneur built the business. You couldn't guarantee at that stage an IPO or a trade sale. So you, had, you structured an exit to the majority. So the entrepreneur is successful. As he's successful, that contingent liability from the put gets bigger and he starts to resent it. Um, and unless you've been actively adding, out, adding value and got your hands dirty and he sees you as a real partner, he's resenting the amount he's got to have to pay you because he's got dirty hands, you don't. So they find ways to transfer price to lower the value of the put. Um, now the way we manage for that is to make very certain that the funds we back have operating partners who can add value, who will be seen as partners by the majority because nobody cheats a partner. Whereas a financier, well, hell, they're, they're a dime a dozen, I can cheat a financier. But a partner, no. So, yeah. Um, a lot of the countries where you're active uh, are very rich in natural resources. Is, are timber, metals, mine, and oil and gas, is that at all part of your... No. Yeah. No. I mean, really like the consumer yeah. Consumer. I mean, most of, if you look at the break, the industry breakdown, um, 45, over 50% of what's the companies inside the funds portfolio are in some sort of consumer facing sector. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not, at the level of the companies, it's not at all a natural resource or commodity play. Yeah. Can you ask minor differences. Um, the, generally it's a 2 and 20 model. Um, because we back first time funds and they can be small, as the fund size starts to sink below about 70 million, we will in fact pay higher fees just to make sure they can hire the team they need. Um, we usually drop out 
at about Fund 3 when we're no longer needed and they've raised, they're raising 500, 700 million. So usually we're not part of the mix when they get to that size. But if we are still part of the mix, as the fund gets about above five, 600 million, we try and push the fees down. Not too much, but by that stage, they're getting a lot of operating surplus, so we try and push it down. Um, the real difference is in the carry, carry waterfall. So I think with maybe two exceptions out of the 180 odd funds we're in, they've all got European style waterfalls. So all the money comes back to the investors um, plus the 8% hurdle before there's any carry. Um, we, for us, it's a deal, a deal by deal. Carry structure is a deal killer. Any other questions? Thank you. Enjoy cocktails.